That is a very cool score, Nathan. Uh, I just really enjoyed looking at that. And, you know, there are a lot of things to say about this. And some advice that I've been giving, you know, in some context um, as possibly correcting something that won't work might actually work in your case, right? So, <clears throat> but let's let's look at some of those things. Now, if you've been following along, and I really hope that you've been watching some of the other evaluations, uh, then you'll know that I have mentioned a few times that just because the um, there are hairpins in the original piano score doesn't mean that the accompaniment necessarily needs to uh, swell along with the melody, right? It's it's really the melody that is doing the swelling in the piano part, right? So, so I mean, take that or leave it. Um, you know, some people chose to swell. Some others, actually much, much fewer uh, scores chose not to. And I felt that that might have been a little stronger, um, you know, just because it's really the melody that's speaking there. Duh. Right? Not the... Not the notes under but you know it, it doesn't necessarily have the same um the same intention it's interesting that you are uh scoring this in uh in d major rather than b major that's um that or excuse me a major uh rather than b major that's a really really cool um idea you know just bringing everything down a whole step <coughs> Now, <clears throat> uh, throughout these evaluations, I've also been advising people to not necessarily assume that the lower register of the flute is going to be able to compete in many situations. And certainly here, you know, you're going to get a an oboe sound, basically, with a tiny bit of flute behind it. The flute really cannot compete with the oboe. Now, the two players can try to balance each other and get a more mixed sound, but that will take the conductor stepping in to comment, right? Or, or possibly the players themselves, uh, if there's really time to work on it. So it is conceivable that you could get the mix right here, but you would really, you know, you would have to put a note in the score, you would have to call attention to it in some way, right? Or, you know, you could also mark like mezzo piano for the flute, right uh and piano for the elbow and see if but but you know i mean we can try to do these mixtures as much as we like but in the in the end it's the pungency of the stronger instrument that is overwhelming so you can have the two you know balancing in terms of projection but the overall effect will still be mostly oboe, right? Mostly the stronger instrument will dominate. It's kind of like um, uh, having a tuba very, very softly double a cello line, right? You still end up hearing the tuba, and you can end up hearing the tuba quite a bit, right? Like the tuba could be playing pianissimo, and the, and the cellos could be playing piano or even mezzo piano, and you still hear the tuba very, very firmly, right? So it balance is more uh, is more than just um, changing levels. And actually, I think I need to make a tip about this too. You know, just the that it's not enough to um, it's not enough to make sure some instruments are louder than others or softer than others uh, in in your dynamic markings because it's just the you know the the sheer power of the instrument. Okay, um, yeah. Now, I'm noticing that you have a, um, a bit of harp here and there, and I'm noticing that you're using the harp to come in on two tees, right? So that is actually kind of a counterintuitive way to use harp, and it's one that's not necessarily effective, right? That's, you know, um, or, or, you know, maybe it is not counterintuitive, maybe it's intuitive to you, to score harp in that way because your intuition is that the kind of um, chordal approach that you're scoring here is a sort of a pianistic one. Maybe you're coming from the perspective of a pianist. All right. Now, the problem with that 
is that any time you're having this much brass play, right, um, or you know this this many you know these like this the big tutti, right? Any time that a big tutti is in in effect, then the harp is actually kind of useless, right? Now here the harp is great because things are softer, right? But even here, where you've got so many horns and tubas, or tr excuse me, trombones playing, um, that harp will just disappear. It's and, and especially in the range that you're scoring it, right? Harp has a tendency to speak out when it is scored higher above the other instruments, right? And then its glittering sound will be very, very obvious. But here, all of this mid-range harp scored at the same dynamic as the other parts is going to just be buried, right? It's going to be useless. Now, of course, I mean, if you were... If you were recording this in a recording studio, say for a film score or something like that, and that approach, then you could turn instruments up and down in the mix all you like, right? In fact, um, you'll often see the um, the instruments that are intended to have some sort of isolation to them uh, behind little sonic walls, right? They'll have little they'll have like glass panels in them so that the so that the players can see each other, or even the conductor, but the um, but the the sound doesn't necessarily interfere. It does like the sound of the orchestra is not hitting the microphone that is recording that more delicate instrument. But that's not uh, that's not something that you can do on stage. So you really have to think about concert orchestration with these challenges. All right. So let's um, you know uh, about the only big problem I see here is that you have this massively long legato line, which by the way is I mean it's totally doable. Okay, uh, and I really appreciate that you didn't put you didn't um, put a legato excuse me a slur line all the way over to two notes of the same character. One of them, the last one of them, being a tenuto mark, right? So I appreciate that. That's great. Okay, but you've got all of this legato in your winds, and you've got almost or you got almost zero in your strings, right? I feel that this would have held together a lot better if the strings had also been slurred together either in you know maybe um you know or even just like maybe the just just saying piano pianissimo legato right just to give the a more connected style you could have slurred across you know groups of two bars or or some other kind of thing i wouldn't slur more than a couple of bars just i mean even at this speed right and it's easier for the players to manage this kind of tempo change if they are able to um, bow rather than slur. I, I just feel that that's, I mean, it's it shouldn't be a big difference, but sometimes, just sometimes the subtlety of it, it's just easier if the tempo change has got a bowing to it so that people can clearly come in on a, on a downbeat that can be guided by the, by the conductor. I mean, I just, I just feel it's stronger. It's not necessarily wrong or right. It's just, I just feel it's, it's clearer. All right, so uh, let's go on to the development. Okay, now once again, um, we're having sort of the same combination that we did before: uh, first flute plus first oboe. And I just kind of have to ask, what is you know what does the you know you really don't bring in the second players until much later, and it's really the same. Uh, it's the same sound again, right? Uh, there's a saying in in British um, sort of Commonwealth uh, uh, parlance, which is called much of a muchness, right? Which sort of means like the same thing again and again, right? And that is something you want to avoid in colorful orchestration. Now, there's a really interesting aesthetic to this score, and I don't want to knock it. And, and I really like the idea of just really beautifully connected... Um, a 2T scoring in, in almost everything. You know, you've got you've got heavily doubled lines, and I, I, there's something really great about that. Um, but here I feel that like maybe it's a little too much, right? The you know you have flute and oboe, then you have flute and oboe again, right? And as soon as you add the clarinet to this, you might as well just forget about the flute. Right? There's just no point. Uh, you know, you have flute plus oboe plus clarinet, and then the flute will lose in that first octave, right? Um, I mean, you might, they could just play for the 
for their own enjoyment of playing, and there will be a little touch of flute to the character of it, but there just will not be very much flute in there, so you might as well just let the player take a couple bars off, right? Um, and, you know, especially here, da 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 you know, it still is a weak area for the, um, for the, for the, for your flute player, and, and, and your second flute player, you know, doubling the, the second oboe, that is also going to be buried, right? So, yeah, just, I mean, the flute, the, the slow flute scoring is just not going to work in these combinations. And, I mean, especially, like, as soon as you add the first violins here, the first violins will absorb the timbre of everything that is playing around them. So, the flute is doubly damned, right? It's just wasting its time with this kind of scoring. Now, interesting that, you know, I was just talking about tuba before, right? Now you've got tuba and contrabassoon doubling here, right? And this is going to end up with an incredibly firm sound. I would mark the tuba here pianissimo or even just leave it out, right? Because the the contrabassoon is already supplying all the weight that you need for a soft texture, for a, for the root of a soft texture, right? So so adding the tuba in there is going to make it kind of firm and even ponderous, right? So ponderous means like kind of um, heavy and clumsy, sort of like an elephant walking around, right? It's, uh, it's, it's just that heavy step. Uh, no big problem with bass drum and triangle, and that's all fine. Okay, but I, I kind of wonder that you don't have any timpani. I, I, I think timpani would, would deal with these downbeats with a lot more delicacy and grace than a bass drum, right? Bass drum just kind of has a thump sound, right? I like the idea of Mark Tree. That's very, very cool. Okay, but let's stay focused on this particular section. All right, and now here we're getting into some some interesting mixtures. Now, this is effective, right? So I've been talking about, oh, you know, not that effective, just combining, uh, combining flute with everything. But here, this is nice. The, this is getting into an area where the flute and the oboe balance better in terms of timbre as well as in terms of dynamic, right? Uh, and then when you get to here, once again, the flute is at a disadvantage when you jump down, right? And get it. So, so the, this bar will have more color from the winds, and this will have less color from the flute right in there. Okay, but this is great. The uh, clarinet's doubling down here. Right, and bassoon and everything else. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is it is perfectly fine for you to have more divisi if you need to fill in some harmonic positions in your in chords like this. Right now, I, I've noticed that it it's it's a very um, I wouldn't say lifeless, but it's a very um, emphasis free kind of uh kind of scoring right uh what does lily have in her um in her score she has staccato and mezzo staccato and she has other kinds of accents and emphases and so on and so forth those have been taken out of your score right now they're there for a reason so review some of my scores and you know the way that i've i've talked about it with other with other entries right okay and um you know, there are some there are some things in here that kind of don't make a whole lot of sense, like mezzo piano crescendo to mezzo forte and back. Right now, now that is sort of like going from room temperature to lukewarm, right? Um, it's it's really like I mean I see what you're trying to do here. You're trying to s gradually get louder, right? You know, piano to mezzo piano to mezzo forte with this little gap in the middle where you jump down to pianissimo, right? Uh, but but I don't think that these crescendo marks are in the original, right? It's just, you know, da, you're going, you're saying da, 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 and then bum, 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 bum. I'm just not even sure that you really need that, you know. Uh, okay. But, you know, I mean, the scoring is okay. 
Uh, it would have been cool to have some trumpet in here, but I guess horns, trombones, tuba. Now here, bum, 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 bum. It's kind of interesting that you were only using like three-part harmony in your um, in your brass. And in fact, it's actually octaves with the first and then the third is sort of playing um, your your third horn here is playing in the middle now <laughs> the problem with this is that if you really want a united a unified sound here um, it, really this this third part should be a second part and it should just be um, written on the same uh, stem as the you know like written as intervals in your in your top staff so first and second just playing this because you know you really want this to be tuned as accurately as possible because uh, there are all of these perfect fifths so it's really better to have the um, the the players who are the most intimate right the first and the second uh, are are the are a team right they are the most important team in the horn section and any work that involves intervals that is you know that is delicate that is weird to um, to tune or to you know the intonation is really critical those people should be paired up now you should bring in the third to like say double lines or play very high harmonies with your first but there, there's nothing all that high right this is actually kind of a low horn part right in here so that's all the more reason why this should be the second horn all right, now moving on, yeah, you just have all of this weight on the bass here with tuba and contrabassoon. Okay, and you got a heavily, you know, you got heavily harmonized uh, winds. And here you just basically have like some harmonies in your strings, but but this will really get absorbed by everything that's going on in the winds and the brass. So the strings here are not going to make much of a difference. Now, if you were to play um, the top line here, this top line in octaves, like the um, the first violins playing the same exact thing as the first flute. The uh, then the seconds playing the same thing that you've scored for the firsts, and then the violas playing what the firsts are playing now, an octave down. And then the cellos, basically playing an octave above the double basses, then. The illusion, there's the illusion that the strings are actually harmonizing fully with the winds and the brass, even though they aren't. As I've mentioned many times by now, that is the oldest trick in the book. Um, you know, it goes all the way back to the, the pioneers of modern orchestration, who just observed that that was a great way to handle strings in a tutti, right? Is that the strings seemed to... Um, seems to spread their tone around to the winds and the brass playing harmonies inside them, right? So that's probably a much stronger way of bringing out the strings here. Uh, but yeah, and once again, the harp is just is going to be invisible. I like the marked tree right here at the end, and the harp could be could contribute here at the end as well. Um, yeah, but this is just kind of strange having the flute play an octave higher than the than the strings. There's the definite risk that a softer flute will get absorbed by the sound of the strings, anyways, and on other other elements that are under it. Uh, that's one one problem, and and just the other is that there's no string tone at this at this register. That's that's a you know I I just feel that that is the biggest problem really. Okay, um, now let's check out the next page. Now we've got the part, right? So uh, this is neat that you've got uh, all winds in here. And uh, I mean, it, it's cool. Yeah, I mean, here you're trying to balance things out. I think you could stay A2 here, right? And then A2 is fine here. Yeah, I mean, why do you need F sharp here to be played by your second flute? Why not just keep them A2 up to the end here, right? Because the second oboe doesn't need any help, 
or excuse me, the first oboe doesn't need any help from the second flute player. It's, it's cool. I mean, it's a, it's a neat uh, combination here. But once again, you're really understating the strings here. Uh, they're just really not not really contributing very much at all. Um, so they're they really are going to be um, they're going to be absorbed into the winds, especially with the with the brass as well. And <clears throat> and the other problem too is that um, that the that the um, higher winds, the winds that are play above the strings, are going to feel kind of isolated because they don't have any doubling or this kind of no string presence. So it's really just going to be about winds here. This is nice. Bum 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 bum. All right. So da 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 dum bum bum. Yeah, and I really liked the way that you handled this resolution right in here. That was all fine. Yeah. I think there could have been more harmony here. I mean, it. I just feel that you you know you have so much weight on that line. You know, F sharp walking up. Da 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 bum, and there's you know still even at that there's just hardly any harmony, uh, in. Yeah, I just think there could have been more harmony in in here. Um, I mean, I, I there's some, but yeah, okay. All right, now going on. Now we go to the restatement. Da 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 bum 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 bum. Right, and then you're just you're really focusing on strings now with uh, wind accompaniment behind. Okay, and that's all really manageable by bringing things down to A. You're actually enabling uh, some of your winds to <coughs> to be able to uh, speak softer, right? And you're also not you have there's no piccolo part in this. There's like there's no hard edge to the to the top of the harmony. That's actually pretty nicely done. Um, you really do feel the drop here, though, right? Da 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 da. Ba 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 ba. You know, I mean, just really, you kind of feel that that you know falling off the cliff right in there. But I mean, it it could be it could be. I mean, it sounds good though, right? I mean, it could be it could sound bad, right? And it doesn't. Um, I appreciate that you are not giving really long phrases in in most places to your to your strings, but I think it still could be more intelligently doled out, right? You're going da da. So there's there's no you know there's no place it's, it's also the same for your slurring of your winds there's no way to emphasize any of these notes right because there's no tonguing on any of them and there's no bowing on any of them right so do you really want that da da or do you want da 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 right I mean there's you know you could have no bowing or you could have some bowing uh, or slurring, right? You could have some bowing or, sorry, some slurring or no slurring, or a mixture. But I just feel that, like, you know, like especially this note right in here, this big, you know, so much impact, and it's slurred, right? So there's just no way to push it. And then right in here, suddenly soft, there's no diminuendo. I mean, that's fine. That's... Yeah, I mean, I, you have the drop, you have the rest, so, yeah. Okay, well, I mean, it's all, it's it's pretty, it'll, it's all going to work, but just think about some of those things, about, you know, you know, having a much more effective push when it comes from an articulation or a, or a bow, like a, the beginning of a new bow, rather than slurring into it. Okay, so, I mean... Yeah. It's so kind of funny that you drop out, the English horn drops out here. I think you could have kept it going. 
but that's all right. I mean, I think you want things to be really super soft here at the end, so that's that's okay. Um, all right, so now we're getting into the um, the part with the goods. Bum 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 blum 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 blum. So I've got a lot to say about this. Okay. Um, just to kind of point out, there is really a lot of contrabassoon plus tuba. I mean, it's just everywhere in this piece. I, I feel that you need to pick one or the other, right? Uh, there's, in all possibility, like a lot of that could just be completely cut in terms of the tuba, right? It's, it's just, it is so much, it is so heavy to score those, you know, contra bassoon plus tuba plus double basses. It's just a fat, fat sound, and you start to lose the sense of, um, the sense of dark color to the uh, double basses, right? That just starts to get lost after a while. And, and two, you know, this is just a practical thing. How long can these low players continue to play so low all the time and just one note after another, after another, after another, right? It's just not very kind to them. All right. So, and now here you're asking for mutes and it's a very, very quick mute change, right? You're giving them, you know, da, 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 rest. Bum, bum. You know, it's just really, it is almost no time. Uh, I mean, if you must have mutes at the end, you'd kind of have to apply them right back here. Or you just somehow work out giving them more time, right? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if you need that. You just would have to work out some way of doing it that's better, I think. They have mutes that can flick on and off in almost a split second. You know, just like tiny little rubber bands, but it's still just so tight. I mean, it is soft. I mean, it, the player, or the, excuse me, the conductor could almost like sort of place the beat right in here, almost like slightly pause before giving the downbeat just to give the string players a little bit more time and, you know, for dramatic effect. But yeah. All right, so the melody here is uh, horn, first horn plus, um, Oh, wait, wait, before I turn the page, all right, before we talk about that, let's talk about your apportionment of horn parts. Right here, this A sharp is a third horn part. This uh, G sharp here is a second horn part, right? The second horn gets the lower middle part. The third horn gets the upper middle part, okay? So please keep that in mind. All right, now let's go back to this, okay, the way the melody is scored. So you have clarinet and horn in octaves, and that is a really kind of organ-like sound, and especially when you reach high up like this, right? Now, there is something, there's a problem here, which is similar to uh, another score I recently uh, evaluated, and that is <clears throat> that you are not taking into account the, um, the sustain pedal right? What does the sustain pedal do in this section in uh, when in the recorded version uh, for piano that was given to us by Sophia, right? And pretty much everybody else's. The player just basically holds down the pedal for four bars. So just because it's only scored, just because the chords are only scored for two bars in the piano score doesn't mean that the sound of them only lasts for two bars, right? If you if you really want to simulate what's happening in the piano part, then you should have your harmony last for the full four bars, right? So these little cascading downwards sections here um, have some kind of cushion behind them, right? Because like like basically when you just stop, I just feel that total emptiness in all of these. I mean, didn't didn't did you feel that when you were listening to your to your um, mock up? The just that just that huge like speaking of falling off cliffs, just falling off a cliff here, just like having this. You know, I mean, did you hear that? I anyway, was just kind of curious. All right, so yeah, so we've got our um, we got winds and that's all cooperating, and once again the um, dropping of the um, of the key signature down a whole step, 
that's really helped a lot. All right, and then uh, we've got, we're starting to get into a place here where your melody instruments um, are being reused as um, as part of these little cascades, right? So that's where things start to get a little dicey because because the kind of the essence of the instrument is um, is just kind of repeating itself, right? So um, I mean, yeah, it's not the same instrument, but it's the same sound, right? So like we're you know, here we've got oboe doubling clarinet, and then the oboe and the clarinet are featured in this kind of downward cascading chord, or these cascade cascading chords, right? I mean, it helps that the harp is there to um, to like change things to change things around to add another layer. However, we do have some basic um, balance problems here. All right, mezzo piano in our uh, in our basic texture, right? Our basic texture here is mezzo piano. Then you have your melody instruments playing over it, mezzo forte, uh, with the brass just as loud. Okay, so why can't everything be mezzo piano and the brass be piano? Then you'll get a good balance because the way things are now, the melody is going to stand out. It's going to just be poking out of this texture hugely and the other thing too is that the brass are going to be way louder than the uh, than the than the winds right so the winds are like a half or a quarter as loud as horns and trombone right or they're about half as loud as horns and about a quarter as loud as trombone so it would really be better to just like Overall, in your entire score, there were, I mean, I've been a lot more picky about this with other, um, I've been more picky about this with other entries, but just to kind of cue you into this, Nathan, is that when you have like combined textures like this, where you have certain functions, whether they're harmonic pads or whether or not they are combined melodic playing or whatever. It is always better to keep the brass down by one dynamic degree, right? So, so for instance, if you wanted a good balance here in your bass, it be, would be better for the trombones to be piano, right? And then you could have your double bass and your contrabassoon mezzo piano. That's all fine, right? And it's not a good idea to necessarily have the melody brought out one dynamic louder, right? That's yeah, that you, you you have to trust that the players know what they're doing and that the that the overall dynamic can be one thing, right? It's better to do that than to score uh, score to um, you know score to some idealized mixed you know like mixed on a mixing board kind of a sound, right? It's better to score to the overall dynamic and pick instruments that will inform that uh, that sound picture, that dynamic level in a clear way. All right, so to, to go on with this and to sort of as an illustration, here your melody is so loud that nobody's going to hear this harmonic cushion behind it, right? And tuba playing mezzo forte against contrabassoon and double basses, you just basically hear the tuba here, right? You'll hear this big fat heavy weight on that low note. Meanwhile, um, not only is the melody going to stick out really, really, really loudly, but the you basically will hear mostly, you know, mostly this um, doubling of horn and trombone. The bassoon won't be audible, right? And then you will sort of hear the triple combination of clarinet, flute, and oboe above. Sort of, you, you barely hear the flute in this. All right, and then as this starts to come in, coming off the diminuendo for forte, if you have no destination dynamic here, like the pianissimo, say, after these forte uh, crescendos, right, because you're getting up to fortissimo here, right? Okay, if you've got no destination dynamic to, the, to end these hairpins of pianissimo, then the first note here by harp and 
and wins is going to be inaudible, right? And then there'll be a sudden break off here right, of, no, of no continuing cushion of, and, you know, and suddenly these players are standing alone in the silence. So, right, so how do you fix that? All right, what you need to do is, first of all, you decide what your overall dynamic is going to be, mezzo forte. Okay, great. So mezzo forte for everybody, mezzo forte for the melody, mezzo forte for the winds and the strings. Now, you come to this place here, mezzo piano, to balance the tuba, mezzo piano for your brass. Don't worry, they will be le they will be strong enough if mezzo forte crescendo is what you want, and then. Diminuendo, everybody goes diminuendo to pianissimo, including your cushion here in the background, right? Because, like, because right now it's just this mezzo forte, suddenly nothing, right? So mezzo forte, diminuendo to pianissimo, continue to tie and extend this harmony behind the, uh, the cascading chords. And then you've got yourself a balanced, uh, you've got yourself a balanced phrase. And, you know, same thing here, mezzo piano strings, same thing, mezzo piano melody, piano uh, brass, piano tuba, and this is all fine. Okay, and this was nice. Da, 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 da. I really like the tremolo, uh, the tremolo strings, and yeah, I mean, it's just so, so unnecessary to have contrabassoon and tuba right in here. You want it to be really soft, right? You just you just cannot default go contrabassoon, tuba, double bass on everything low, and especially it's such a delicate piece like this, right? It's like you know, it's like adding a sledgehammer to your bass line with with everything, even softly, right? Yeah, a soft sledgehammer is still is still has weight, right? Okay. Um, Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, this is all nice. I like the English horn plus clarinet thing. And the oboe plus flute. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. I like the ending. That's great. Okay, but yeah, and once again, like, this is kind of a thump rather than a ping, right? So consider replacing all of your bass drum part here with, um, with uh, timpani. And I think that that would that would work a whole lot better. Okay, so, you know, despite the fact that I just kind of slashed this to ribbons to a bit, and I apologize if so, it's it's not meant to be pejorative, but rather in terms of just, you know, feedback in, in a way of strengthening this score, because obviously there are some really great things about it, right? And, and I meant what I said at the beginning, that I really felt that you had a, had a great approach to this. And I, I like the idea of like heavily um like all the heavy doubling that you do you know that um that just in the way that you did it that has not yet been done in any of these entries right so um i mean there has been heavy doubling but just the the overall approach and aesthetic that you applied using it is definitely your own so um Despite that being the strength of the score, though, um, I would challenge you to more um, to make more intimate statements with uh, certain instrumental episodes, right? Uh, and and the piece for next year uh, that I've got coming up is just filled with possible moments where you could do that, where you know, where you can use winds in a more chamber music kind of a way, or you can use like solos. You could bring out certain uh, melodies certain episodes as solos on different wind or brass or even solo violin right solo cello and then build delicate textures around that or build textures around solos of instruments that move you know that have a lot of motion have a lot of um momentum to them definitely our next uh our next orchestration challenge selection is going to have a completely different feel to it. I'm not going to say what it is yet. <laughs> no clues as to who the composer is, but it, just to know that it will be very different from this score. Um, but I felt that it was really great to feature this particular music because it brought out a side to a lot of orchestrators who have been indulging in these challenges for the past couple of years that I hadn't seen before, which I thought was great. 
And, you know, obviously in this case with your entry, Nathan, um, this may have been maybe your first attempt at, at uh, some, some pure impressionist style scoring. And you didn't do too badly. I thought, you know, I mean, I just, I just feel that just watch out for things like balance. Watch, watch out about using certain things too often, like the triple combination of profound bass instruments. Um, you know, watch out about the way the sustain pedal works to fill in things that you would normally think were empty bars. Uh, you know, there there are a few basic lessons in there, and a few, uh, and then just a few little kind of tips and so on. And I'm I'm gonna write down that tip about um, about timbre affecting balance as much as dynamics. So, anyhow, um, I really appreciate this. This is really great. I I was it was you know great to have this amongst the last little round of evaluations for the dotted brev slash longa level players on patreon and you know of course part of that is just the is the support that you've been giving to the channel and that is hugely appreciated i want everybody to know just thank you so much for that um it's it's uh, very kind of you guys i know these are tough times out there for musicians and i just you know i do not take it for granted i just stand constantly amazed at you know your at your generosity and your involvement and you know how much you care about the community continuing on with um you know with feedback and tips and whatever i'm able to tell you from my long career of being an orchestrator so so thank you nathan thanks everybody who's watching and um i think that i'm going to be able to do a couple more of these evaluations today. This is great. I'm feeling really good about this. And uh, my voice is in pretty good shape. And we, I should be finished with these evaluations by tomorrow. Um, and then we'll be on, we'll be back to WC, we'll be back to other things and possibly um, some new, some new things, some news. I'm sort of putting together some things uh, for the upcoming months as people are still kind of, um, are still isolating because of our international situation. See everybody soon.